Hello, I'm Richard Woodruff, the City Manager for the City of Jacksonville. We're going to begin a series of programs designed to help educate each of the property owners and citizens of Jacksonville on issues relative to land development in our community. In the spring of 2014, the Mayor and Council will be asked to adopt a new code that will guide in our future development of the city. It is therefore essential that we provide you, the citizens and property owners of our community, with information. Today we're going to introduce Land Use 101 and we're going to deal with some of the basic ideas of zoning and land development. Joining me this morning is a great group of professionals with the city. We have Reginald Goodson who is the Director of Development Services with the city. Reggie? Yeah, thank you. We have Ryan King, longtime resident of Jacksonville, who is also the Administrator of Planning and Permitting. Abigail Barman, who is a professional land planner and is a senior planner with the city. Come on. And Jeremy Smith, also a senior planner with the city. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you for having us. You know, when it comes to zoning, that's a word that most people don't really understand because they don't deal with land development. Now, if you're a builder, you might know that. If you're a realtor, you might know that. But the average citizen or the average business person doesn't understand the concept of zoning. So who would like to begin? What is zoning all about? I will begin, Richard, thank you. Um, zoning, there are two parts to zoning. We have the zoning map and the zoning text. And the zoning map divides the city into different zoning districts. And what most communities usually have, they have a residential zoning district or districts, and you'll have some for single family development, some for duplexes, some for townhomes and condominiums and then some for the large scale apartments that you see on Western Boulevard. You also have office and institutional zoning districts, commercial zoning districts, and industrial zoning districts. Now the zoning text identifies the uses that are permitted in each one of those districts that I mentioned. It also identifies the standards that govern lot sizes, uh, lot coverage, building height, setbacks, parking, landscaping, and signs. Okay. Why is that important? Why is it important to have different districts? Well, we want to have like uses in, in you know, certain areas of the city. So in a residential district, you want compatible uses to the residential uses. You don't want a gas station in the middle of a single family development um, like um, Carolina Plantation. Um, also, you, know, you don't want a single family dwelling next to a large industrial use because the noise and the smell of the industrial use will infringe on the quiet enjoyment of the single family residents. Now when it comes to zoning, is this something new to the country or has it been around a long time? It's been around a long time. Um, the first zoning occurred in 1916 in New York City. Um, the development that caused the zoning ordinance in that city was the equitable building. Um, it was in lower Manhattan and it was a huge building. It was 538 feet tall and it was massive. It took up the whole lot. So the, the legislators of the city decided they need to regulate zoning to protect the public's health, safety, and welfare. And so that's where the, the city of Jacksonville and most cities get their authority to zone and regulate land use is through the health, safety, and welfare clause in the laws? That's correct. Okay. For me, I think the simplest way to look at zoning is protection of the community as a whole. You wouldn't want your neighbor to start a business or something that's going to cause you to not be able to enjoy your home. You wouldn't want bright lights, a lot of noise, or things like that next door. So it's to protect the enjoyment for everyone, not just to limit your personal property rights. Okay. Well, Jeremy, when it comes to the type of things that a zoning district uh, tries to regulate, uh, Reg, you mentioned the equitable building that started all of this in New York City. In New York City, a building, Reggie, how, how tall did you say it was? 538 feet high. Okay. Uh, I don't think we have any structures quite that tall in Jacksonville, but what do the zoning districts as far as regulating, what type regulations occur through zoning? Well, if you're related to height ends in terms of Jacksonville, uh, most of our heights aren't that tall. Uh, the typical height regulations are 35 feet. Uh, rezoning also regulates uh, the, the amount of landscaping on commercial property, uh, lot sizes in residential developments. 
um, the connect connectivity to uh, current uh, streets and it also uh, when you do have those opportunities where you have residential and commercial in proximity to them it requires buffers and whatnot between those properties so really when you're when you're talking about districts then what you're saying is that we've broken the community up into specific areas where we want single-family development specific areas where we want commercial others for industrial others for multiple family others for open space and parks and inside each of those districts there are regulations that establish everything from setbacks to height to parking to landscaping Correct. okay now that sounds pretty simplistic uh, why is zoning though important again for a community well in the city you know we're very dense all the properties are close together as opposed to the county in the suburban area where you have larger lots so when you have smaller lots you want to regulate um, to make sure that each property owner rights are protected and their neighbors rights are protected also um, since you're so close together you know you're impacted more by what your neighbor does on his or her lot that's right we have some lots that are as small as 3,000 square feet in our downtown area and most of the typical residential lots that you see in Northwoods and Williamsburg and Carolina Forest you know at minimum is 7,000 square feet but they probably average closer to 10,000 so you you figure that's a relatively small lot because we do provide urban services here in the city of Jacksonville. So you want to make sure that there is some setbacks from your neighbors um, so that you can protect your, your rights as, a, as an individual and have some space from your neighbors within an urban and dense environment. You know, it's not only uh, protecting rights, it's probably also about protecting property value, isn't it? Correct. And how does zoning protect property value and the investment that an individual puts into their, into their home or their business? Oh, a good example of that would be we do require when unlike land uses abut one another, we do require buffering to provide some setbacks, some additional setbacks than the typical building setbacks and buffering so that there is a space between the parking lots and the adjoining land uses whether of a lower intensity. Can you give me an example where you require the buffering? A good example of that would be between, um, say, businesses on Henderson Drive that abut uh, the single-family subdivisions that are on either side, whether it be Cardinal Village or the East Gate, South Hall, and Aldersgate area. There's a 30-foot buffer requirement between those land uses, the commercial on Henderson and the residential behind it. Now, Abigail, Reggie mentioned a moment ago the zoning map and the zoning text. Uh, I think most of us are familiar with highway maps, even though in this day of technology, I doubt if many of us have these paper maps mm -hmm. anymore. But uh, talk a little bit about the zoning map and the zoning text again. Well, the zoning map has each parcel without the city. It gives it a zoning designation, whether it's residential, commercial, industrial. And within that, there are a list of uses that is found in the text. So the map will simply display each parcels with a color. The color coordinates with a zoning designation and a text describing the height of the building that's allowed in that district, the types of uses allowed in that district, the setbacks, and all of sort of the development regulations associated with that zone. Okay, so a person can look at the map and they will say, I'm single family. Then they can go to the text and they will find out all of the uses and the setbacks and the regulations. Now, Jeremy, in planning and zoning, we have some special terms. One is called a permitted use. Another is an accessory use. What does that actually mean? Well, within each district, as Abigail mentioned, there are per permitted uses. And these are typically your primary uses of what the zoning district allows. Uh, for example, residential zonings uh, are residential multifamily, um, RS6 or RS7s. They, they'll allow various residential types, single family, um, perhaps duplex. Um, for our business zonings, they would allow retail, wholesale, uh, beauty shops, beauty parlors, those type of uses. And then it steps up to a more intense zoning to industrial, which as it sounds is going to allow your processing, manufacturing type facilities, um, so, uh, building yards, storage facilities. Uh, along with those permitted uses are your incidental or supportive uses and we call them accessory uses. Uh, for example, going back to the residential, uh, an, an accessory use for residential is a storage shed. 
Uh, it's not the primary use. You're not living or habitating in it, but you're storing equipment, farm tools, or your lawnmower. In the business district, a good example is a restaurant. Its primary use is to sell food. However, a lot of our restaurants in the city of Jacksonville have an accessory use of a bar that has alcohol sales. It's not the primary, it's supportive of what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, another example, going back to our residential accessory uses, is the home occupation. Sometimes some folks will have a home business, um, in-home daycare, um, that they run out of the home that is keeping with the residential nature, but it's accessory and incidental to the home. And then we go to the more uh, controversial uses that the uh, city council identified with adopting a zoning ordinance, and that's what we call our special uses. They're not necessarily bad for the zoning district, but they have aspects that the city council has deemed that they would like to have some more review on it. They may require more buffering through a hearing, they may require a certain type of lighting, or even hours of operation. And typical special uses are tall telecommunications towers, um, some intense industrial uses, um, and even our uh, nightclubs, bars, and taverns. Now, Jeremy, one thing you mentioned that I want to clarify, you said, for example, that if you have a shed or a pool, that those would be accessory. Yes, sir. So, for example, if I own a single-family lot in, let's say, a Carolina Forest, and I'm not going to build a single-family home, I just decide one day I want to go put a swimming pool in, but I'm not actually living on that lot. Is that going to be allowed? No, sir, it would not be. Accessory uses are accessory to a principal use. And in this case, the principal use would have to be a single-family home in that particular development or whatever that particular zoning district deems to be the principal use okay. would have to be located on the same lot. The exception to that would be if pool was identified as a permitted use within the zoning district. And in that case, a pool could be constructed on a lot. However, in most of our single-family districts, you will find that a use is typically going to be a single-family dwelling. Churches and schools are also typically allowed in the residential districts as well, but the primary use would be residential. Okay. And the, the accessory use has to be one that's customarily found in connection with the principal use. It also has to be um, smaller than the principal use, can't be larger than the principal use. So, for example, if you had a um, detached garage in the rear house of a single-family dwelling, the detached garage could not be larger than a single family dwelling. So I can't, uh, if I own 18 cars and I want to put them behind my house in Williamsburg Plantation, that's probably not going to be allowed because the garage would be four or five times the size of the single family that's structure. Right. That's correct. Good. Well, basically, zoning has to do then with how we're going to have compatibility, where uses are going to be identified in each specific district. Regulations are established for setbacks, height, parking, landscaping, and you have the permitted principal uses, which are the main uses, and then you have the accessory uses, which are things like swimming pools or storage sheds that would only occur after the residence or primary use, principal use is established. All right, well, this has been a good discussion of some of the basics relative to zoning. Let's begin to talk a little bit about land use. Now, we've talked about zoning as far as districts. What's the difference between land uses and zoning? We have a land use map, we have a zoning map. Abigail, what's the difference there? The key difference um, is time frame. Zoning is sort of what is allowed now and what's on the ground and how it's being used currently in today. Land use is saying, where do we want to go in the future? How do we want our community to develop? So the city has actually two maps, um, a zoning map and a future land use map that look very similar and a lot of people to the untrained eye can confuse them. Zoning, for example, if you have an undeveloped lot on Western Boulevard, right now it could be zoned B1. And the future land use that gives you the permitted uses for that site, the future land use would call that regional commercial, which says that we want that to be the commercial center. There's other areas that we may want to sort of redevelop, like our downtown. Our downtown has a lot of vacant buildings and things like that, so our so focus with the future land use is to make that our downtown core. So we give that a special designation, 
and that's how we want it to develop in the future. So zoning says what's there now, and then the future land use is where we want to go in 20 years from now. And of course, because uh, a community's life is centuries long, a land use or a zoning that may be thought to be correct today in 2013 may not be what we want it to be in 2020. Is that the concept of the difference? Correct. Something that may be a single family neighborhood that was kind of on the outskirts of town 20 years ago may now be off of Western, where it's a major commercial corridor. So while it may be a single family residence today, it may be zoned R7 or one of the residential districts 20 years from now, that could be the new restaurant corridor, that could be the new hotel, because we have a lot of traffic and that's sort of the way our community is growing. So we want to be able to recognize those patterns in our growth now as far as new development, new roads, traffic patterns, and plan for water, sewer, different types of development so that 20 years from now, when that does develop that way, we're prepared for it. There's a um, connection between zoning and land use. With our comprehensive plan, you know, planners a lot, a lot of times we like to say we get out our crystal ball and we decide how the city is going to develop each parcel, how it's going to develop over the next 20 years. But once we decide that, the tool that makes that work or implement is the zoning, zoning um, ordinance. So the zoning ordinance implements the goals, objectives, and policies of the land use plan. So Reggie, if you look at uh, the 17 corridor that's now growing out towards Piney Green, uh, most of that property is, is undeveloped. We have just recently seen a, a tremendously nice uh, auto dealer in Toyota go out there. Yes. But what you're saying then is that when you have undeveloped property or developed, but let's use the 17 corridor as undeveloped, we know that in time the city is going to grow out that way. Right. So land use planning comes first. Is that how it works? Land use planning does come first because that's the vision. That's how we want that area to grow over the next 20 years. So we assign a land use category to that part of the city. And how we implement that, we later come back and zone that in accordance with how we um, vision that developing over the next 20 years. So for example, again, at that corridor, we know Piney Green is uh, in the process of being five lane with water and sewer improvements. So we have a land use map that talks about the, the potential for commercial. Right. But that land use map doesn't actually say a auto dealer should go on this lot, a retail store on that lot. How does the zoning then get applied? Well, the land use map would identify it as Abigail said, as maybe regional commercial. So we know what type of uses are going there. Then we have to look at our zoning code and say, okay, which zoning district would complement regional commercial? And we have a B1 zoning district now that's commercial. A lot of the zoning you see on Western Boulevard is B1. So we'll take that B1 district and zone that parcel to make sure that regional commercial will be allowed to happen on that lot in the future. Okay, good. Now we talked a while ago in the zoning part about the fact there was a zoning map and a zoning text. Is there something like that relative to land use? Yes, there is. We do have a future land use map. And as Abigail mentioned, if you looked at the zoning map next to the future land use map, they'll look very similar. It'll be all of the city of Jacksonville and they'll have colors that differentiate the different types of land uses. So they do look similar. But the land use map is more kind of a generic layout. It's, it's residential, it's commercial, whereas the zoning may have five residential districts and three commercial districts. So it's more generic where we see our growth headed as we move forward, which allows council to um, decide when to put infrastructure in place and when to approve rezonings based on the growth patterns we expect to see moving forward. So really, if I can use the analogy, the land use plan is more of the vision, the 30,000 foot level view of what we want the city to be in the future. And the zoning then takes that down to ground level, 500 foot level of how it actually gets developed. Is that the concept? And, and today versus long term, for example, the Althanth Corridor on 17 North, for example, if it's currently zoned residential and of our long range plans recognize that that's the direction we want to move in, it may show up as commercial, which means that as uh, rezonings were to come before City Council, that if that area is identified as a commercial area and a request is made to change that from residential to commercial, Council could support that rezoning based on the, the future land use plan in the map associated with it. You know, that also brings up the, the concept of property that's already developed 
was developed, let's say 30, 40, 50 years ago, how does the land use plan work with those properties? And let's use as an example, uh, the New River Shopping Center. Obviously it's called the New River, but it's been there since the 1950s. How does it impact a property like that? Well, you'd have it zoned a current, you know, current way today, and then it's also identified on the future land use plan. It may be the same or it may be different. And if it's different, let's just use it as a hypothetical, if it's identified as a um, multifamily type area instead of the commercial, then if a plan was brought before city council and a request was made to go back to commercial, then council would be able to say, well, that's not exactly the way that we see the city growing. And therefore, if it's not an appropriate proposal, you know, they could basically deny that request. We, we work you know, closely with those people and try to set up the land use plan based on the existing development, but also where we see the city growing. Now, when it comes to uh, individual property rights, obviously those are things that the courts protect, but the whole purpose is to make sure that we also are protecting property rights through zoning, but we're also trying to protect the city's future through the land use plan and together they help us build a better and better community. Abigail, you mentioned something that's important though. Uh, what's the connection again between land use planning and infrastructure planning? Um, I think the biggest connection is the preparation for growth. The city um, will continue to grow and continue to add density if it grows inwards and needs to add infrastructure as far as roads, water, sewer lines as it grows outwards and being prepared to supply those things and help with development and help with the capacity is basically the purpose of future land use planning. Well, this has been uh, very informative from the standpoint of looking at land use as a future tool of planning our future, also planning the, the multi-million dollar investments we have to make in roads and water and sewer and parks and schools. And of course, zoning is the down to earth today. As Ryan said, it's the today part of land use planning and community development. We've talked about land use planning and zoning, but how do we actually get a specific development, lots that people build on? What's the way that works? That would be through the subdivision process. Subdivision process is where you have a large tract of land, like I've got here on the screen that basically a developer wants to take a 20 or 30 acre parcel, however large it is, and cut it into smaller tracts of land that they could then develop either single family houses or, or commercial developments on. Subdivision is both for residential and commercial applications. There are three types of subdivisions. We have a major, which is typically dealing with new infrastructure, so you'll have a surveyor and engineer involved. Uh, a lot of times there's stormwater um, devices that are designed as part of that. We also have a minor subdivision which is typically a little bit uh, smaller and in less than five lots for uh, the minor things where the infrastructure is already in place. And then we also have three exempt subdivisions which still involves a surveyor but it's basically when you want to adjust your lot lines between you and your neighbors or if you have a two acre parcel and you want to cut it into three uh, three tracts of land you could do that and there's also a, another exemption that's available so it just depends on the situation that you're in. So let me see if I understand Ryan where we talked earlier about zoning having setbacks and so forth uh, when I enter a typical subdivision I may not realize it but every curve in the road is designed a certain way. Now we've all been out someplace and and the road scene or the curve seemed to be too steep does subdivision regulations cover things like that too? It does. We Our subdivision ordinance references our manual specifications and standards and design. Uh, we refer to it as MSSD because that's a mouthful. So they do regulate the curves. They regulate the street widths, the curb and gutter requirements, sidewalks on streets, the dimensions of a cul-de-sac bulb so that our fire trucks can make uh, maneuvers and turn around in those cul-de-sacs and also maneuver the streets. It also regulates the types of pipes that go in the ground, the, 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 the way that they're made, the dimensions required, the water flow that's required so that our fire trucks can uh, 
you know, put out a fire if necessary. Well, I suppose then you're actually saying from the taxpayer standpoint that by having uniformity of how you build a road or uniformity as to the gauge or thickness of a pipe, that's all covered in the subdivision regulations? It is. We want to ensure that we're having quality development that is being constructed in our community. And the primary reason is a lot of times the developers turn the maintenance over to the city. It becomes city infrastructure. And the city is responsible for maintaining those improvements. So we want to make sure that we are not taking on something that's going to be a maintenance problem moving forward, which ultimately is a maintenance problem for the taxpayers. So kind of in summary of basic uh, land use 101, we have a land use master plan that tells us the future vision of the community. We have zoning that helps us decide today what's going to be built and how the setbacks and heights are going to be regulated and the compatibility between uses. And then you have the subdivision standards that actually tell you or tell a developer how he is going to develop the subdivision itself. Correct. And when all of that comes together, Jeremy, what do we have? We have a well thought out, laid out, growing city. Well, thank you all. Land Use 101 is something we deal with every day. We hope that you, as the residents of the City of Jacksonville, have benefited from this. In upcoming sessions, we're going to talk about the new codes that will be coming up for adoption in the spring of 2014. Thank you each. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.